Jesus taught us to pray on earth as it is in heaven. But that seems hard to imagine. The church exists in a world of chaos and division. And because it is composed of fallen humanity, the church sadly doesn't look much different. What can we do to set ourselves apart? We look to Jesus. By his grace, we have salvation, redemption, and forgiveness. For he chose the church and made us holy and blameless. Christ came to bring together all things on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus, who is far above all rule and authority, the head of the church, calls us to be echoes of the same unity that exists in heaven, something we are not able to humanly accomplish, but because of Jesus and the redemption he is working out in us and through us, we are transformed, we are different, we are redeemed. Indeed we are. Good morning. Yeah, it's been a great morning here at Washington Avenue. Worship uh, just awesome. Uh, always is, but I really love today. We welcome you here to the services. If you're watching with us online, we welcome you as well. We're glad to have you a part of what we're doing here, no matter how you get there. Uh, we hope it's a blessing to you as well. I know a guy who climbed Mount Everest to the top. Um, I, I would be more accurate to say I met a guy who climbed Mount Everest um, many years ago. And, and in fact, uh, the, the, the fellow went back years later and tried to do it again. I think lost his life in the process. Um, it's a pretty daunting thing to climb a mountain like that. 4,000 people have done it, um, which sounds like a lot of people. But out of 7 billion people on planet Earth, 4,000 isn't even on the scale. Um, and the reason I mention that is because uh, in Scripture, the section of Scripture that we have been working toward and getting ready to unload today is a Mount Everest. It's a big deal. There's a lot there. And sometimes when you're faced with a mountain-sized anything like that, you really don't have a lot of hope of getting to the top of it. Uh, I... I I just think it's important for us to accept that a part of what we're supposed to do when we read all of these verses and internalize them is we're supposed to just be able to stand back and say, wow, that's big. I, I don't even pretend to try to be able to climb all of this. I, we're not going to get to the top. Um, we've got a lot to cover today, and, and we're just going to kind of be more like when nowadays, you know, I used to climb mountains some, but nowadays when I go... I usually like to drive my car as far up the mountain as I can, and, and then you get at the visitor's outlook center, you know, the overlook, and then you, you look and some guide or park ranger will tell you, okay, that's this mountain and that's this mountain and that's this mountain and that's this mountain, and the big, big, big one there is this mountain. Um, that's kind of how I climb mountains uh, these days. Um, so today, I am, the, I am the park ranger, I am the guide, and I'm going to point out some mountains in this incredibly huge range, and we're going to take a really quick look at it, okay? Before we unpack, let's review just a little bit. The existence of a church in Ephesus was not an accident. Paul had traveled to Corinth on his second missionary journey, and Acts 18 tells us that he met a couple there named Priscilla and Aquila, and uh, they traveled with him then to Ephesus. Later on, um, during his third missionary journey, Paul went back to Ephesus and he found a church there. Evidently, Priscilla and Aquila had planted a church there, and he would stay there for two years, the longest he ever stayed, I think, with any church, and the church would grow dramatically. Years later, imprisoned, Paul would write this letter that we are reading to the church at Ephesus, and we've called this the letter that he always wanted to write. Because as you read it, you will begin to find out it doesn't deal with any problems in a church. It doesn't deal with correction. There's no defense being made. There's no warnings. It simply paints a wonderful picture, a majestic picture, maybe the best picture in Scripture of what it means to be a Christian and what the Christian life is all about. We summed it up in our first lesson a couple of weeks ago this way. He's writing to remind them who they are and what they have 
so that they will know what to do. That's pretty good foundational information for misfits in a culture that would come to hate them and hunt them down and kill them. It's pretty good foundation when everything else around you is uncertain, when it's shaking and quaking, whether that be in Ephesus in the year 60 or in America in the year 2021. I really hope that you've been reading and rereading Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. Uh, I'll give you your next assignment, that is to read through the end of the chapter every day in the coming weeks so you'll be ready for what comes next week. As you've been reading that, I have a lot of people have told me, I've been reading it, Jim, but, but I still don't get it. I, I still don't understand it. It's still just blowing my mind, and I'm going to tell you, that's good. If it overwhelms you, that's really good because that's Paul's intention. No matter what else I say today, be sure you understand that this We've used the analogy, truckload of gifts is shipped to you. If you are in Christ, all of these crates and boxes that we're about to encounter are already yours. It's not something you have to go looking for. You don't have to climb a mountain to get them. They're already yours. It's kind of like you go into a room, and there's this massive Christmas tree, and there are hundreds of presents under the Christmas tree, and you go up and you look, and every one of them has your name on it. Smile, because that's a pretty good thing. So we're not going to get to the top of the mountain, but we are going to look at it. And my goal is that you just will be able to say, wow. Last time we talked about this, we ventured into the tall grass and deep theology around the loading dock where the truck sits now loaded with these blessings all sent to us by our Father in heaven and through our brother Jesus Christ. We took a quick, awe-inspiring, yet head-scratching look at the biggest crates in the load, and we'll encounter them again here in a minute. We're back to finish the business, so let's roll up our sleeves and get ready to sweat just a little bit as we begin to unpack this amazing truckload of blessings, all given us as gifts that are given to every follower of Jesus Christ. And as you hear these and as we work through them, just understand, this is who you are. This is what you have. And yeah, it's a lot to take in. It's a lot. But this is what the Christian life is all about. I'm calling this lesson today, 10 Reasons to Praise God, and if anything should scare the fool out of you, it should be a preacher saying 10, okay? Well, get over it. We're going to make it, okay? Hang in there. Okay, let's get into the text. We're going to be reading again just because repetition is good for us in this. Verse 3 is where we'll start. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. That's the first of the ten things that we will praise God. It's because He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Now, we're going to read a little bit further in a minute, but verses 3 through 6 begin before light, before matter, even before time existed. God was there, and He was making decisions that would change and chart history. And the first decision God made was to bless us with every spiritual blessing. And you know, the fact that we can even read that verse and it talks about blessing us, it isn't talking about blessing them or blessing those. It's talking about all of us who are in Christ. Um, Shane is doing a, a new blog every week. It's a, a podcast, actually, kind of, a, kind of a, a video podcast or just one that you listen to if you want to do it that way. And it's called Memento. And I'm just going to put you onto that because what he's doing is he's trying to go back and look over some of what we talked about on Sundays and help you to maybe remember. Do you know that there are a lot of weeks when somebody asks me on Wednesday what I preached about on Sunday and I can't remember? And it really worries me about you, right? Because if I can't remember, it really worries me about you. Memento is there to help, so just check that out, okay? And he talked about in the last edition this, this we business that Paul is able to actually talk to us which is huge, huge deal. And we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. Now, to bless here, we talked about the, the sort of a, like a, a, a eulogy. It means to bless, um, to speak well of, to benefit, to do good for or to someone. And this particular verb for bless shows up all over the Old Testament, and that means God really loves blessing His people. Paul uses here the past tense, because this is a done deal, and he tells us specifically then where the blessings come from above. 
That's kind of intriguing, isn't it? These blessings were secured in heaven. They were created in heaven. They were delivered to us. They are all heaven-made and heaven-sent, all from God and only from God. You know, it's too easy down here in the mud to get whiny. Any of you ever get whiny? Sometimes you get whiny, we lean into our poor, pitiful me parties. And if you've ever wondered when something good was finally going to happen to you, well, stop wondering because it already has. God blessed you with every spiritual blessing. Now, Paul is going to get more specific about those blessings. Verse 4. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. The second reason we have to praise God is because he chose us. We talked about this um, at some length two Sundays back, so I'm not going to rehash it too much. But I just want you to know that this idea of being chosen or elected forms the basis of entire major doctrines in Christianity and libraries full of books have been written about this Mount Everest-sized idea. This is covenant language, and the Jewish believers would have heard it for what it was, and maybe us not so much. But we understand the psychology. We talked a couple of weeks ago about the power of being chosen as opposed to being rejected. We understand that being chosen is a powerful thing, and we need to remember that God chose us first before He did anything else. And it doesn't negate our faith. It doesn't take away our responsibility. But what it does emphatically underscore is that it happened by God's initiative, not yours, not mine. Paul is going to call us in chapter 4, if we ever get there, to live lives worthy of our calling. And the fact that we've been chosen and knowing that we've been chosen should both motivate us and humble us and change the way that we live. So you need today to feel chosen for something special. Let's read on. Verse 4, we'll go back to the start and take a run. For He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. In love, He predestined us to be adopted as His sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with the pleasure of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, which He has freely given us in the one that He loves. All right, we spent a lot of time on this one two Sundays ago, so we're not going to camp out here. But uh, and if you have questions about it and, and you were confused the first time, well, go listen to that podcast again. I guarantee you'll be confused again. Do it all over, okay? Um, just know what this means in terms of blessing is that a very, 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 very long time ago, even before time was counted in days, God decided and determined that one day He would adopt you as His son or daughter. And He made a way through Jesus Christ for you to be a part of His family. That should make you feel loved. You know, there's one old preacher example that describes our grace relationship with God and they have you imagine this. Imagine you're standing in court. You're, you've, you've committed a crime. You're guilty. The judge on the bench is God, and God passes sentence on you. He declares you guilty. But then he does something strange. He comes out from behind the bench, and he comes down to where you are, and he reaches in his pocket, and he pulls out the penalty. He pays the fine that you have been assessed because of your wrongdoing. That would be pretty amazing, wouldn't it? The judge declares you guilty, and then he pays your fine, or he does your time in jail. Something even more has happened here. God declares us guilty because we are, and He pays our fine because of our sins, and then He takes us home, and He gives us His name, and He makes us a part of His family, and that's amazing. So we should give thanks to God because He has predestined and adopted us. All right, the next three, numbers four, five, and six, we're going to take as a group. You're feeling some hope now, right? All right? Um, verse 7, in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that He lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Right? Three things right here, number four, five, and six, that we can give thanks and praise to God for. He has redeemed us. He has forgiven us. He has lavished his grace on us. 
You may have noticed, if you're perceptive, this has kind of been our primary focus so far in our We Are series, We Are Redeemed. This verse begins the second of three sections in Paul's treatise, and if you could use a single word, and it's why we did, to sum up Christ's activity on our behalf, it would be the word redemption. If you want to divide all of God's activity on earth into four qualified segments, it goes like this, creation, fall, redemption, culmination, or consummation, okay? Four very distinct segments, and if you're noticing that, we are currently in the third stage of the outworking of God's plan, and we have been ever since Adam and Eve left the garden. Didn't last very long in perfection, did it? We have been in the redemption phase, and God is going to spend the vast bulk of human history involved in this redemption phase until as many come to know Him as possibly can And then he will come again and we'll enter the consummation phase. I wish he would come today, don't you? I would love that. We're in this third stage, though, that occupies such a huge part of his focus. Redemption includes these huge but not-to-be-minimized blessings of forgiveness and lavished grace. Uh, Redemption, the, the word, the idea literally means purchasing and setting free by paying a price And it very often applied to the condition of slavery or prison. The readers would have understood this very clearly because slavery was a very real circumstance of daily life in their culture. The blessing here is that, and I quote a commentator, He has taken us from dirty to holy, from shameless to blameless, from guilty to forgiven, from slavery to freedom. We have been set free. Paul loves the concept of freedom. He has a lot to say about it in his letters, especially Galatians. But we Christians in Amarillo, Texas in the year 2021 need to hear this just as badly because a lot of us live in prisons. A lot of us live in prisons of or in slavery to the past, wrong things we've done that make us feel dirty. Or things others have done to us that make us feel damaged and unworthy. Or sometimes we live in cursed, self-imposed prison, chained by habits and addictions and bad choices. Let me just tell you today, the cure is there. The cure is God's unlimited, unmerited grace. I love the word Paul uses as he describes it, lavish. Isn't that a great word? God's lavish grace Michael DeFazio says, this means God wants to repurpose you from a hot mess to a well-ordered thing of beauty, from a nasty little fuzz worm to a glorious high-flying butterfly, from a random pile of rusty metal to a fine-oiled, powerful machine, holy, blameless, forgiven, redeemed. And you know the price that he paid for all of that, only all the blood of his only son. Now we move to number seven. Let's roll back to verse eight, I think. We talked about what we've been given, the riches of God's grace that He lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding, and He made known to us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure which He purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. Seventh reason to give thanks and praise to God is because He has informed us. You could say it like this, God Almighty, the Lord of the universe and everything has let little all us in on His plan. He has given us eyes that can see the secret. He has explained to us the mystery of His will. Now, any of you, do you ever make things up as you go? Most every sermon really is up here. Is it? No, no, I don't know. No, don't do that. I really, I, I sweat bullets over these things, but I make up a lot of other things as I go. And God doesn't ever do that. God never does that. I get in a lot of trouble. God never does. From before time, God has had a clear plan in place to reconcile sinners to Himself. It says in Revelation that Jesus Christ was slain before the foundations of the earth. He has a plan 
to reconcile sinners, but also to break down the wall between Jews and Gentiles. When Paul talks about the mystery, that's really the big thing that he's talking about. And that's a lot bigger thing than you or I imagine. We're all Gentiles here, okay? So maybe it's not as big of a deal to us, but the line that divided Jews and Gentiles back in the time of Paul's world was incredible. It was a wall you could not get over. It was a gulf you could not bridge, and yet God has done that very thing, and Paul wants them to know. Paul has always spent so much time in his letters trying to explain what we call the gospel. This is no surprise to God. God has always known his plan, but he chose not to reveal it early in the game. It's sort of been hidden, but no longer. And what Paul wants them to know is that if you are in Christ, you are now in the know, and God has let you in on the secret. And the one link of chains that weaves together the story of heaven and earth from before time all the way through to the consummation after time as we know it, the chain and the links of that chain, the thread, you might say, none other than Jesus Christ. All right, verse 11, in Him we were also chosen having been predestined according to the plan of Him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of His will, in order that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of His glory. Um, Translations get a little weird, and and they differ a lot in this verse, in verse 11. Um, I usually like the NIV, but the NIV says chosen. It it said chosen back up in verse 4. It says chosen again here. Other translations, in fact, the footnote in your NIV will tell you, it might also say, you have been made an heir. You have been given an inheritance, okay? Others say appointed. The thing that you're going to praise God for, number eight, is He has provided an inheritance for us. The chosen selection here that the, comp, that the, the, the translators used in, in verse 4, and they're a lot smarter people than I am, so I'm, I'm not going to second-guess them very much, but there are two different Greek words in play here. And the verse that they've translated chosen in verse 11 is not the same as the chosen in verse 4. This one is a rare word, and it means giving someone a task or role to play. So it's not only that God picked you, and you can see the force of chose, it's that He has also given you a job. He's given you a mission. He has gifted you uniquely to carry it out. As one's chosen already for an inheritance that is irrevocable, a settled matter, all the wealth of heaven, we enjoy the rewards of knowing that. We enjoy the rewards of our salvation now, and we participate in the mission of sharing the wealth and inheritance with as many others as possible because there are a lot of people out there who may not have heard the gospel call. There are a lot of people out there who may not understand that that's for them too. You know, it's interesting, isn't it? How many of you have done the DNA thing, you know, where you scrape your cheek and you send it off and find out you're seven-tenths Indian or something like that and didn't know it? Um, It's a big thing now. Imagine that through all of the overlapping things of DNA that something is discovered about your bloodline, and so you get um, some kind of notification, okay? And this notice that you get is, hey, we have discovered that you have royal blood, and not only do you have royal blood, you are rich. That'd be a nice notification to get, right? Some of you are going to go home and swab your cheek and send it in now. Um, you know, it's like, it's like yeah, you, you actually are royalty, and that means that you will inherit a, an incredible fortune. You are the lord or lady of last buddy, Okay. And it's all going to be yours. No, no, that wouldn't be nearly enough. Mount Everest, all of that is yours. You're going to inherit all of this wealth. And wouldn't that change the way that you lived every day? Wouldn't it change the way you looked at life if all of a sudden you saw yourself in a different way? Well, believe it. And if you don't believe it, there's more. And we pick it up in verse 13. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of His glory. Here are the last two things that we can praise and thank God for. He has sealed and marked us in Christ. 
He has gifted us and guaranteed our inheritance. Both of these I have grouped together because they talk about the Holy Spirit. And both of these pictures come from ancient origin. The seal speaks of uh, like a king's signet ring, or sometimes they would have the signet on top of a, a staff or a scepter, and it was something they would use that was a very special form of identification that was only theirs. Nobody else had one like it, and they would mark a document, and it would certify that that document was legal and binding, and in this case, it's legal and binding forever. And Paul then goes on. Uh, And Paul loves this phrase. His favorite way to talk about the Holy Spirit is by saying that God has given us, this is the second picture, a deposit guaranteeing some places where it shows up Scripture say what is yet to come. This one says guaranteeing our inheritance. Paul loves that phraseology. In, In the Bible times, the word described that we're talking about here described a down payment. You all understand down payments right? Maybe a better expression would be earnest money because when you put earnest money on a house, and some of you um, have bought houses, you know what I'm talking about, that's when you get really serious, okay? Not so serious when you're just looking, but when you write that check that you are going to lose if you don't carry out the contract, that's pretty serious, earnest. And that's exactly what it's talking about here. A buyer would complete a transaction and this earnest money would guarantee that they're going to go through with it. They're going to pay the full amount. It's a binding pledge. This last part of Paul's load, the seal and the gift of the Holy Spirit are a promise from God and they're already in our possession that point to all of the treasures and all of the spiritual wealth that will one day be ours in heaven. That's a lot. Do please note one word before we move on. Note the word guaranteed. In our culture, words are cheap, aren't they? And promises are cheaper. And there is truly very little you can count on with absolute certainty, but this you can. God doesn't say, well, okay, um, we're going to slip you in under the wire And we're going to hope for the best. These last two crates of blessing tell us that he says, let me put my very spirit inside you now so that you can know beyond any doubt that your hope is certain and secure. I love to use some of Paul's verses when I do funerals and we're standing around an open grave because people need to realize we're not looking at that. That's not the end of anything. We're talking about something that's going to happen down the road. We're talking about the future. And when Paul says he has put his spirit in us as a deposit, guaranteeing what is yet to come, resurrection, heaven, eternity, all amazing, amazing things. I love the way DeFazio sums up the core meaning of Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 14. You think you're unloved? You're not. You think you're forgotten? You're not. You think you've been cast aside, left behind, tossed out in the cold to find your own way home? You haven't. You think you're an accident or a freak of nature? Not a chance. And he goes on to underscore this. You are not a person who has to watch everyone else be given gifts and benefits and opportunities while you get passed over. On the contrary, God has blessed you in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. You are not a person whom no one wants on their team. On the contrary, the God of heaven and earth chose you before the creation of the world to be part of his group. You are not a person wandering aimlessly through a world in which no one has your back. On the contrary, God predestined you for adoption through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. You are not a person who is forever imprisoned and chained in habits and hang-ups that hold you down. No, by His grace, you are holy and blameless, forgiven and redeemed. You are not a person who has been kept in the dark, left to find your way through a hostile and threatening world. On the contrary, with all wisdom and understanding, God made known to you the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure. You are not a person who has been relegated to the bench who has to wait and watch while everyone else plays their part. 
On the contrary, you have been brought into the story at this very moment and time in history so that you can be a part in helping the Lord move it forward. And finally, you are not a person who has no idea how the story will turn out. And if you'll be on the winning side when the final page turns, on the contrary, you have been marked with a seal. The promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit, guaranteeing your inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of His glory. I think it's safe to say, as he summed it up so well, being saved is awesome, and God is awesome for saving us. Amen? So we should praise Him. I've given you ten reasons. And we should spend our lives thanking Him every day for all He has given us and for what we are made to be in Christ. Right now, as we finish, I want you to find, you, you were given one of these when you came in, um, in your bulletin. If you didn't get one, be sure you get one. There's some at the back still, I would imagine. Look like there might be a couple up here. This is designed for a reason, and it'll be up on the screen in just a minute so you can see it, even if you don't have one in front of you. This is designed so that you can take it home and you can stick this the most important place in your house, the refrigerator, okay? Because I want you not just to have studied this stuff and now run off and forget it. I want you to spend some more time considering this Mount Everest-sized load of blessings you've been given. And so take this home and stick it on the refrigerator. And every time you go to the refrigerator, which for me is pretty often... Um, might be a pretty good diet. You'll spend more time reading than you will eating, perhaps. Just work down through those ten blessings and remember that they're yours and that they are there. But today, as we finish up, what I want you to do, I want us just to spend a little time kind of bringing it all in. And we've got some music that's going to play here once everybody gets wired up. And what I want you to do, two different things, okay? Right now, the first thing I want you to do is I want you to look down through this list and I'll be quiet here in a minute so you can do it. But I want you to look at the things on that list that you're familiar with, that you already know about, that you cherish, that you've unpacked long ago, and that you're so glad God has given you those things. Look down through the list. Look through all ten. Identify the ones and say, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. After you've thanked God for those that you're familiar with, go back and look at the list again. And as you work down through it, identify the ones that maybe you don't know much about or the ones that you've never thought about being something that would describe you as a follower of Jesus. Maybe identify some you have no idea what it means, but you're pretty glad that it's part of the list and you'd like to know more. Maybe identify the ones that even though they've been delivered to you a long, long time ago when you became a believer in Jesus, they're still either on the truck, waiting at the dock, or you've unloaded them. You just never have really unpacked them. Think with him about those for a couple of minutes right now.
Isn't that a mountain-sized load of blessings? Just too much, really, to take in. But let's finish by thanking God for what He's done for us. Lord, this is big stuff, and we are small children. Lord, help us to be rightly amazed at what you've done, at what you've given us, because you love us, because you call us your own. Father, I pray in the days ahead you would help us to not forget this list, that we would revisit it often, and that every time we see it, perhaps you would open a new facet in our thinking. Help us to see a different way in which this gift is expressed and offered. Maybe you would help us then to see what responsibility it gives us as your children to live according to the calling and the gifting we've been given. Lord, I pray that you would make us bold in claiming each of these gifts, finding them, seeing them in our lives, and then make us bold as we live and work in this world, that we might be proclaimers of your goodness and that we could help others to hear the call of the gospel so that they too could know the riches that can be theirs in Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, we pray today. Amen. Well, there's a lot on that truck, right? told you there was. You've earned lunch. It is that time to go home and recharge and rest a little bit. We have lots of things going on, some things starting even here tonight, pizza with the pastors. Um, some of the classes are getting rolling this week. Don't miss out. It's still not too late. Hey, thanks so much for joining us for this week's message. If you've been impacted at all, let us know down in the comments or send us a message at whackonline.org. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on social media. Because the more engagement that this generates, the more it will be put in front of new people. And that's what we want to do with Church Online is reach as many people as possible and welcome them into the body of Christ. Remember, at Washington Avenue, we are real people experiencing real grace. We'll see you next time. <laughs>